knowledge, that urge to know, interest, curiosity. It's something we all human beings have, and the ancient Greeks were no less curious about themselves and the world around them, as the writings of philosophers of the time do indicate. But of course, they weren't fortunate enough like us folks with Google. In ancient days, Greeks went to oracles to obtain the answers they desired. In some aspects, at least, they resembled modern people who try to discern their own futures by searching for answers from astrologers, fortune tellers, or psychics. The ancient oracles were the priestesses and mystics that served their community by entering trance states to communicate with the gods and goddesses of Greece and Rome, as well as many other regions in the Mediterranean, North Africa, and South Asia. They had many names, but often held the titles of Sibyl or Pythia. The oracles of Greece and the Sibyls of Rome were women chosen by the gods. It was thought that the very gods themselves spoke through the mouths of these oracles. They were popular throughout the great empires, and pilgrims would make their way from far-off places just to ask them a question and receive the answer from a god. Different gods spoke through oracles at different locations. Apollo at Delphi, for example. Oracles were consulted on matters of state, military operations, law, family, and personal matters. The prophecies and messages were mysterious and cryptic. Phrases which sounded poetic and profound were also vague and open to interpretation. The Sibyls were the Roman equivalents of Greek oracles. The origin is a prophetess named Sibyl. Who, like the oracle at Delphi, spoke the words of Apollo by going into a trance. The tradition went on, and women were chosen by the gods to become sibyls. The most famous of the sibyl was Cumae, who wrote nine books of prophecy called the Oracula Sibyllina. These books ultimately predicted the fall of the Roman Empire. Although many accounts show that their prophecies were true, this is a bit skewed. They were not infallible, and many texts refuse to mention the errors that the oracles and sibyls made. They were not perfect and gave false information on occasions, but they were still a central part of the Greek and Roman religions. So, what kind of questions would people ask? Questions about happiness with future spouses, or whether or not one would have a child, or about whether or not one would find a good job, were all common concerns among the ancient Greeks. Other concerns were safety of future journeys to colonies, and about sacrifices to gods to ensure continued good health. These were some of the questions ancient Greeks asked of the oracles, and for which they would never get a clear answer. Some of the people visited oracles asking questions in order to solve crimes and mysteries, expecting the wisdom of the god and their representatives on Earth. For example, questions such as the identity of a thief, the individual who poisons a certain person, or even whether or not a child the wife was carrying was in fact that of the husband. A more common example of questions ancient Greeks asked the oracles was, "To which god should I pray in order to see my business prosper, or bring happiness to my life, find a good spouse, or have a child, etc." However, the answers were almost always enigmatic. King Croesus of Lydia asked the oracle whether or not he should go to war on his neighboring kingdom. The oracle replied, "If he went to war, a great kingdom would fall." Croesus interpreted this as being his enemies, but it turned out to be his own kingdom. When the Persian army under Xerxes approached Athens, the Athenians wanted to know whether to fight the Persians, and of course they went to Delphi to ask the Pythia. Ambassadors also consulted the oracles as to what policies were best to pursue. The most famous of the oracles was the oracle of Apollo, the god of the sun, at Delphi. She was named Pythia. Travelers would ask her questions, many quite personal, such as those dealing with love and marriage, and she would go into a sort of trance and spew out rhymes and riddles for the travelers to ponder. These riddles were supposedly the words of Apollo himself. She would also receive prophecies from dreams. If we take this from a scientific perspective, the possibility that the trances that Pythia would enter. Could be caused by inhalation of large amounts of carbon dioxide, which could produce hallucinations, or she might just have been having some special mushrooms, or it might have been all a drama. However, scientifically speaking, the release of large amounts of carbon dioxide 
could be due to the volcanic faults that ran underneath the Temple of Delphi. One of the oldest oracles in Greece was the Oracle of Zeus in Dodona, which was located in northern Greece. Priestesses called the Pleiades would translate the oracles sent by Zeus. They listened to the sounds of pots hanging in the trees, the sounds of the wind and other sounds of nature. They would then translate these noises into a prophecy from Zeus. They believed that Zeus's voice could be heard through the wind. Plato mentioned an account that he had with the Pleiades in his speech, Phaedrus. Herodotus also had mentioned accounts of these priestesses. Epidaurus was the site of an oracle of Asclepius, the son of Apollo. The oracle was a man named Aelius Aristides. Pilgrims would go to him to ask questions that dealt with medicine, disease, and healing. He was said to give medical advice, and many of the pilgrims hoped to be cured miraculously. Aelius also made prophecies based on his dreams, much like Pythia at Delphi. Rituals were performed before the travelers received any answer or cure from Asclepius. These rituals included sorts of sacrifice or abstinence and fasting. Those awaiting miracles were recorded to have gone into a hallucinogenic trance during their slumber. This was supposedly the sign that a miraculous healing was taking place. The oracles were constantly turned to in times of crisis. These ranging from medical epidemics to plagues to wars and invasions, the Delphic Oracle was mostly consulted with such issues as these. She told leaders to invade certain areas on many occasions, usually Roman cities or provinces. They did as they were told, although she was not correct every time. The army also turned to Pythia during the wars with Persia. She had predicted defeat to the Greek army. This prophecy was also incorrect because the Greeks defeated the Persians. The influence of the oracles began to wane, although not completely obsolete until the 4th century AD. The oracles and the sibyls were very controversial figures in Greek and Roman religion, because on many occasions their predictions and prophecies were not correct, and they were proven fallible. Even though they remained to be significant in the religions and beliefs of those of some of the greatest civilizations in the world, the question of whether their riddles and predictions were of divine origin or substance-induced hallucinations will remain a mystery. What do you think? Were these oracles genuine? Or was it all just a magic mushroom? Comment down in the section below, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the like.